Amen. I want you to take your uh, handout you'll find there in front of you. And I want us to do this. Let's read uh, our verse together. You'll see it on the screen. This has been our model, our theme throughout. So let's say this together. This is right out of, uh, well, let's say, yeah, the, the theme together. Let's say both of these together. Let's say the theme first. Empathy is the pathway to peace. All right. Then Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, what we've done, we flipped this verse around, noting that there is actually a pathway to progress, a pathway to peace found in this verse. And so each week of the three, we've been looking at one aspect of this verse. Last week, we, we started with this idea of empathy. Write this down. Empathy is the pathway to peace. Empathy is the pathway to peace. Empathy is the ability to, here it is, understand and share the feelings of another. It's the capacity to place oneself in another person's position to feel what they feel. I've already had a conversation this morning about how radically different whites and blacks. I know we have Hispanics. This is not just a black and white issue. Uh, we have others here, perhaps Asian. Uh, more and more, our, our city Dallas, a global city, more and more our nation is becoming more and more diverse, and uh, it's going to just get more and more, become more and more that way. In fact, in, in 2014, it happened and nobody realized it, but for the first time in American history, all the children five years old and younger uh, were, were not white. That, that group is not only growing up, but more and more Hispanics primarily and others are moving into um, into the United States to the point that 2043 market. That's when there will no longer be a majority race in in the United States. Now, that'll happen a lot quicker, a lot sooner in Texas than that. So this idea, this sense of, of being able to live together in diversity is uh, is not going away. It's only going to increase. It's why we've got to get this right. And you know this, the next generations, they're doing a little better job. But of course, we would have thought that probably 20, 30, 50 years ago, right? And we're starting to see that some, in some ways we've taken a couple steps forward, maybe a few back. And so that's why we're here today. But we've got to feel what others are feeling. I've yeah, already had conversations about how differently we, we view things in our culture and issues that we see in the news. Uh, we've noted that this is a church issue. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. This is why we, we, as brothers, we come together and we suffer when our brothers suffer. And we rejoice when our brothers rejoice. And Romans 12, 10, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We're to have empathy, to feel what others are feeling, to step into their space and to be like Christ in, 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 their, in their lives. So look at number two, humility. Here's the path. Humility leads to empathy and empathy leads to mercy and kindness. All right. So humility uh, helps us to come at, at, at the table, come into relationships, see what's happening, to read, to understand. Humility allows us to say, I don't know all that I need to know. Humility leads to understanding. There are some things you need to know. And we're going to talk about that today. Pastor Carter said it last week. Uh, you know, the truth will set you free. And we're going to talk about truth today. We're going to talk about uh, some things we need to know. But we've got to come at it humbly. Because, uh, you know, we know that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James 4, verse 8. This idea of mercy, maybe you know, mercy really has often been defined as um, not getting what you deserve. You know, if grace is getting what you don't deserve, if justice is getting what you do deserve, then mercy is not getting what you deserve, right? So what does it mean to show mercy? Other translations show kindness. Um, it means that what I might think even, how about that, you deserve, and we do this, we sin, we're so sinful that we look at someone and we make assessments about who they are as a person based on the color of their skin or based on how they're dressed. And we do this and we, when we categorize people in our minds. I think so much of what we do in our lives, so much of what we say is subconscious. It's not explicit, but we see it and we make judgments. That's how fallen we are. But as we, as we think about mercy, it means that, that I'm, I'm not even going to give someone what I think they deserve. Instead, I'm going to extend grace. 
uh, as, I, as I am in, encounter people and, and seek to be like Christ. Well, Ephesians 4, 2, it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as. Everybody say, as. As, as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Whoo! Yeah, now, that's a whole, nother, that's a whole series of, of talks when we think about as God in Christ has also forgiven you, we're to forgive one another. And then in Galatians 5, 22, 23, you'll see that kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. So this idea of showing kindness. Now, number three, look at this. This we're going to focus today. Last week, we looked at the first piece of that, to be humble. This week, we're going to talk about showing kindness, but showing kindness and being humble. Being humble means it leads to understanding. Understanding leads then to empathy, empathy to kindness. Kindness leads to doing justice. That's what we're going to hit on next week in a big way as we think about next steps. Now, number three, then, truth matters. Many want to debate the facts around racial issues and reasons for division, but there's a greater overarching truth that is often misunderstood and overlooked. And it is the truth found in the, write this down, the history of systemic racism in America. You'll, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's my whole hope today, is as I share, that it'll set you free. Now, I've, I've said it before. What I'm going to share today, I've shared a bit in the sermon. I'm going to go into a little more detail uh, today in a short period of time, but uh, then give us time to talk around our tables. I want you to be thinking. I'm moving to a kind of a presentation where you can take notes if things hit you or thoughts you have. We've got some questions around the table that we're going to talk about here in a bit. But... Um, one of the reasons that we see things so differently when there's an, yet another shooting uh, on the news, you know, immediately uh, I've, I've seen that the white man wants to run to the facts. Let's get to the facts. Uh, what happened? He, he was high on something. He must have shot somebody. He, you know, he must have, oh, he had a gun. And then you, then you realize in uh, issues like in Charlotte not long ago, well, he had, a, he had a book in his hand. And then there comes all these protests downtown, and then you realize, no, he had a gun in his hand. You know, uh, he was waving it around. And then uh, something I heard this week, uh, uh, Bishop Claude Alexander, a friend of mine, Pastor Carter and I both, who is a, a pastor in Charlotte, he was noting that even in that case where you had a black officer shoot a black man, he was noting that racism is not simply the uh, the, you know, the person who was shot, but the perspective of the one who is bringing about these thoughts or, or actions of racism. In other words, a twist, it's possible for a black man to be racist towards another black man, profiling another black man. He said, uh-oh, he's from the hood. Uh-oh, he, I, I know who he is. I know what he's like, right? And we do this. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. Our policemen, we know this, our police officers, we have some here. Our police officers have split second decisions to make these life or death uh, decisions. None of us would want to be put in, in that situation. They're trained. They are aware. And more and more training has come in recent days. But, but we, we honor our police officers. I've said it before. I've said it many times. You can be pro-black and pro-blue. There's not a distinction. And we can support our officers. And we can support uh, community relations between our officers and and the, uh, and, and the communities and, and the people who, who are being protected by these, these, these brave men and women. So I, I don't want anyone to hear that we're, these gatherings are, are anti-police because they're not. Uh, we, we seek to understand. But here's what's going to help us. I'm going to walk through a, just a quick history. I'm going to buzz through this rather quickly. But there's so much more that I could say. If you want to see a, an incredible documentary, if you're on Netflix, you can find it. It's called 13th. Anybody seen this? It's called 13th. I want uh, my white brothers to make a note. It's, it's incredible. It's hard to watch. Um, it's about the 13th Amendment, uh, which, of course, set, uh, set all people, well, you know, supposedly it, it ended slavery. But really, it's from one amendment, from slavery to, uh, to prison, from slavery to incarceration. We're going to talk about the problem of mass incarceration next week, why is it the case? What, are, what can we do about it? Some of our men are involved, have been involved in ministry down in, in the southern sector of our city, specifically at Cornerstone Church, where, uh, where we have many uh, men come out of prison, and then they try to get their feet back on the ground. Many of our men are involved. and I, In fact, I've been asked uh, to get more and more Concord men involved in a ministry called Men of, uh, men of Nehemiah, which is down in, in South Dallas as well, right off MLK near Fair Park, not too far uh, a ministry that takes men 
uh, off the streets or even out of prison and then gets them back into, into uh, a regular way of life. And, and there are many opportunities for us there. So we're going to talk about some of those next week. All right, let's jump in. Now, this is going to be hard to hear, but I want you all to listen. I've said that our black brothers have this cultural memory, whether they know the facts or not, of what I'm going to share. You know a lot of them, a lot more than my white brothers. So I want to just share this, take some notes if you need to, or just listen in. I want to talk about really buzz through about 400 years of slavery in America and how we, we now see this cultural memory coming into play and how we view the world today. Okay, this is going to be, be, be tough to hear, but I want to say it. Um, our country was really founded on two, two crimes. One was the genocidal dispossession of, 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 of land with, among the Native American Indians. You can say what you want to say. Uh, there was no great war. There was no great battle. We didn't come to conquer, uh, you know, North America. But that's in the end what happened. And it didn't happen without force. And, and, and the other sin, the, the original sin, America's original sin is that of slavery. The kidnapping, uh, the, the, uh, the enslavement of ultimately millions of African Americans or Africans at the time. By the Emancipation Proclamation, we had an estimated 4 million slaves here in the United States. So our country was built on the backs of men, primarily, and women, ultimately children, who were brought out of their homes, away from their families, stripped away from life as they knew it, and, and all for the forced labor and benefit of wealthy white landowners in America. Now, this is an essential and undeniable truth, but it's constantly being suppressed, I think, blurred over, distorted, excused, or, or somehow this revisionist history. And for a lot of us, it's just ancient history uh, for a lot of people. And here's the, what you're going to learn today. It's not really ancient. You might say, well, those things happened a long time ago because I'm going to start at 1607. But what happens is there's threads that constantly run even today. And we're going to see the impact of it all. And my, my hope, my prayer has been that we'll all understand. We'll all have a greater understanding. Understanding leads to empathy. Empathy leads to kindness. Kindness leads to doing justice. All right. So 1607, there was no evidence of African slaves. A John Rolfe, uh, was, was a man who ultimately married, you might know his story, he married uh, Pocahontas. So there's Pocahontas, um, who later became Rebecca after she was baptized, her Christian name. John Rolfe was a very astute businessman. Now, I'm going to let, let Disney help us uh, whether, the, whether John Rolfe and Pocahontas <laughs> were actually uh, in love with each other. Stories are they had quite a romance and loved each other. But he was an astute businessman. Pocahontas was way up in the uh, Indian culture, and as a result of the marriage, he became an even more wealthy landowner. In 1619, Africans, well, um, yeah, Africans were brought to America by the Dutch. So 20 Africans were brought uh, here by, and this is in John Rolfe's diary, actually. They were, there's the question, were they slaves or indentured servants? And I think there's really not much of a difference. They, they were brought uh, involuntarily. And they were forced to do what, what the master told them to do. So you tell me, you know, is that a slave or a servant? Uh, now we see in, in the Bible, we do see a very, we, when we think of slavery in the Bible, uh, that is much more of an indentured servant kind of context. We think of, of, of American slavery. That's not what we see in the Bible. So that's worth noting when you look, read books like Philemon and other, other books and, and challenges that Paul brings to to the, to the slave, to the servant. He calls himself a slave, doesn't he? He says, I'm a bond servant of Christ. Well, in 1949, John Punch became the first slave, the first legally designated slave. He, along with two whites, um, this is a, a movie actually portraying this story, two whites, one was Irish, one was Dutch, and John Punch, African, they lived in Virginia. They escaped their master. They, they're on the run. They find themselves, no, they're, they're caught in, uh, in Maryland. They're caught in Maryland, brought back, and then they're placed uh, really under trial. Now, it's important to note that in Virginia, where uh, the fathers of much of our, of our legislation and lawmaking comes out of, watch this, white, wealthy landowners in Virginia. They were the legislators making these decisions. Now, what happened in the case of John Punch, the two whites were given uh, four years uh, as indentured servants. John Punch was, was designated a slave for life. This is the first time that we see in history, a um, um, first example of permanent slavery. Uh, this is the beginning of slavery, you could say. 
1676, uh, Nathaniel Bacon leads a rebellion to eliminate the, the Native American Indian right along the Jamestown River. Ultimately, they had to eliminate and eradicate uh, all the Native Americans. If you're going to move forward, you heard of the, the Manifest Destiny. Right. Many people believe it was God's will that we expand. That's the destiny, the destiny of God, that we move westward and we take all the land all the way to the Pacific. In order to do so, we'd have to, again, eradicate uh, the natives along the way, if that were the case. In some cases, we sought to to work with them. In other cases, no. Uh, And so we took the land. And then even all the way, when you think about the Mexican War, you think about Texas, And then in 1680, Virginia legislators, um, they sought to define what it means to be white. You had to have this designation. By this time, there had been a uh, real mixing of the races. Blacks, whites, uh, Native Americans, whites, even blacks. John Punch had married a white woman, in fact. And so interestingly, in uh, 2012, Ancestry.com traced back and then made it, it was very public, uh, that that, uh, 13 generations from John Punch, the first slave, in North America, traced uh, all the way to Barack Obama, president of the United States, out of his, out of his line and, and lineage. The Virginia House made an effort to define what it means to be white, but they couldn't. Pocahontas and John Rolfe uh, had children of mixed race as well. In 1789, our Constitution is written. Our founding fathers had an opportunity to really, now they, they did state that all men were created equal, but they didn't go far enough. We saw slavery continue. Racism existed in the South and in the North. Uh, we see the slave trade that just continued to expand. I was in, we've noted I was in Charleston with, with Pastor Carter this past summer, and we were there right where you can still see shops and you know all the great restaurants in Charleston, but there's a place where slave trade took place right there. And, uh, and, and Sullivan's Island, not far from there, was a place where many slaves came into Wilmington, where, back, back east where I'm from, and Charlotte, the promised land. And then uh, up north, um, it was even more so. We saw slavery, slaves coming into Providence, uh, New York City. So it wasn't just a southern thing. Now, it's interesting. In 1790, um, you look into the, into the area of reason and, and science, a guy by the name of Johann uh, Friedrich Blumenbach. He came forth with a division of human uh, races. Um, and, and it was called, it's become known as the Oids theory. You probably have heard he separated different uh, people groups, the Caucasoids. So you have the Caucasians from the Caucasus Mountains. You have the Mongoloids from the Mongoloid Mountains or the, the Mongolian Mountains, the Austroids from Australia. You have the Negroids. Okay. And here's what's interesting. The Negro, Negroids were the one group that had no geographic place. All the others came from a place. And it's been noted that if you don't come from a place, you're not human. If you don't have a home, then you're just a nomad, right? So it's very interesting how this played out. And, and uh, just a little bit of science there that's, that's very interesting to note. 1791, again, only rich, white, wealthy men could vote. And you can imagine how they would vote for, for laws that would benefit them. Slavery continued to grow. And as a result, the wealth continued to grow and America then became the greatest economic machine in all of history. And you could argue built on the backs of slaves. Now, that's not true across the board, but in many ways. Now, remember, women couldn't even vote until the suffrage movement in 1921. So, you know, we're talking about as we get closer, you're going to see how this continues to play out. The Civil War, of course, came 1861 to 1865. And the battle, this is a much greater debate, but it was over states' rights. I've had people try to argue that, well, yeah, it was over states' rights. It wasn't really about slavery. Okay, no, what was the singular right? And why was it split north and south? Many would say, well, the south was an agricultural you know, uh, kind of a way of life. The north, not so much. And that's, that's, that's not, not true. Uh, it was split because it was over the right to own slaves. So the Union ultimately destroyed the the Confederate army and decimated the South. Um, I heard a sermon preached by the pastor at the AME, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston. Uh, You know, it was just a year ago where, and this is interesting, after 51 years, it's not like it's been there since uh, since the Civil War. 50 plus years, the Confederate flag flew over 
the, uh, the Capitol building in Columbia, South Carolina. And a lot of white people, frankly, and, and black brothers, you don't need to understand this, you know, a lot of white folks are just kind of ignorant and just go, oh, that was, you're not the South. I'm from the South, you know. And then a black brother sees that, as Pastor Carter even noted. He got to OSU and realized, man, guy's got a Confederate flag on his wall. That represents those who, who, who owned slaves and were pro-slavery. And so I heard a sermon. The title of the sermon, and it was phenomenal. The title of the sermon was, What Goes Up Must Come Down. And it was a challenge that says, hey, not only the flag, but racism has got to come down. What, what goes up must come down. So then we see the Reconstruction era, or period. And I'm going to press on here. Seeking to rebuild national unity and rebuild the government. A lot of work to do during that period of time in our history. And to give civil rights to slaves. Well, the final years of the Civil War, uh, Union lawmakers debated various proposals uh, uh, for the, for the reconst reconst Reconstruction. Now, some of these called for constitutional amendments to abolish slavery altogether. This was uh, a lot of... A lot of movement then in the Senate and a lot of leaders, a lot of, and they were white leaders who were seeking to abolish slavery. On December the 14th, 1863, a bill proposing uh, such an amendment was brought by Representative James Mitchell Ashley of Ohio, Representative James F. Wilson from uh, Iowa, soon followed with a similar proposal. It was January 11th, 1864, Senator John B. Henderson of Missouri submitted a joint resolution for, the, for a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery. There was a, sen a Senate Judiciary Committee led by Lyman Tr Trumbull. I'm naming these men because these are the men who made it happen. They were white men who said this has got to stop, and they became involved in, in merging different proposals for an amendment. Radical Republicans. It, were, it, was, it, was, the, it was the Republicans that led, led in Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, We've got a picture of him right here, Pennsylvania Representative Thaddeus Stevens. That's our man right there. So these two, we, we owe a debt of gratitude to these men. They sought for a more expansive version of the amendment. Ultimately, it came as the Emancipation Proclamation by uh, Abraham Lincoln, the great liberator. Uh, he was with the Whig Party, by the way, initially, and then, then was Republican as he was voted, ran on, re-elected on a platform of, of abolishing slavery. And so he gave an executive order, took place January 1, as they've been working on it throughout 1864, 1865, January 1. Now, I noted that for those of you who are about my age or so, when I was in Charleston and when I read this history and realized it was just 100 years prior to my being born, um, that's an amazing thing. We've got to remember that. It's, it's key, man. That wasn't long ago. And it's why if one generation doesn't pass on to another, uh, the fact that all people matter to God, this idea of equity and justice, mercy uh, and justice, then, then we're in trouble. We've missed it. And when one family doesn't pass it on to another like food through the body, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't happen. And it must come from, from us as men. We must lead the way. We must teach the next generation. Well, then in 1865, of course, the 13th Amendment was established, which uh, stated that all slavery should be abolished. Now, you would think, well, good. We can press on. That's 100 years ago. Not so much. Many of you know that there's, there's a piece in the 13th Amendment. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. But it said that all slaves are to be set free except in cases of crime. This is why we're going to get into a little deeper. We have, you know, there's more people incarcerated in America, mostly black men, than any place on the planet. And so it's, it's why we're going to understand the connection between slavery, 13th Amendment, slavery to incarceration. You can't vote if you're incarcerated. <laughs> And, and, the, and you, you lose rights and all these things. So we're going to talk about that. And some might say, again, the white men, you know, we're prone to say, well, what are the facts? If somebody breaks the law, they ought to be in jail. If somebody kills somebody, they ought to be in jail. I think all of our, our black brothers would agree with that, right? We all agree with that. But, but, the, but, the, but I want to challenge you to think, are these men criminals? You could say they broke the law. Yes. Okay, they are. Okay. Are they criminals or are they victims? to systemic racism, and if that's the case, what are the issues that brought about criminal activity? 
This is the case for white and, and black men. What are the systemic issues around that? And what can we do to make a difference? We're going to talk about that in the days to come. All right, I'm going to press on. But it's really important, these next pieces here. During the stock market crash, 1929 now, let's fast forward a little bit. Horrific time under uh, Hoover as president. Then in 1930, and the, and the folks that were hit hardest, you know, of course, whites uh, who had great wealth, but those who didn't have much of anything had nothing. And so it was, an, it was an incredibly difficult time. 1933, the New Deal, FDR. It was in 1934 when a significant moment, he signed the National Housing Act and, and a, a purposeful act to give housing and work to, to the poor. But what happened was billions of dollars came, a federal money came to those in need, but there was something called redlining that occurred. Redlining was circling communities they would not receive that kind of support. Many of them, most of them, black communities. In 1935, for instance, the Hoover Dam was built. 20,000 people worked on it. Very few African Americans. Then came the Public Works Project. Monies went to white suburban development, not so much to urban blacks. So you can see how this continues to play out. World War II, we needed more and more Tuskegee Airmen, black men who contributed greatly in World War II. Hundreds of thousands of these men served. Uh, and, and, and what happened was they'd find themselves in Europe, walking the streets of Europe. They were honored and celebrated. They got home, and it was a completely different picture. And what happened when these men got home the GI Bills helped white soldiers go to schools like Duke, the Ivy League schools, the finer schools in America. The blacks could essentially only go to the HBCs. Anybody? Historically black colleges and universities. Now, great schools, but they couldn't get the same jobs. So the white are amassing wealth. Not all, but many. Not all, by a long shot, but many. So then the greatest generation passes $12 trillion on to the boomer generation. Mostly white. Money passed on to whites. This next generation is going to pass on, by the way, 30 to $40 trillion. It's going to be passed on to their children. And blacks are not passing on that kind of wealth. Now, it's true that not all whites are passing on that kind of wealth. I could go on. I think could talk about the Hill, Hill Barton Act, reconstruct hospitals, not so much black hospitals, because you realize there was the separate uh, but equal, supposedly, uh, with the Jim Crow laws. So 1890 to 1965, we had the Jim Crow laws. Right? Uh, these were state and local laws enforcing racial segregation, uh, supposed separate but equal. Many of you, uh, let me ask you, how many of you remember these kind of laws and the impacts of these laws greatly impacted African-Americans. Listen to this. Patterns of housing segregation enforced by private covenants, bank lending practices, job discrimination, including discriminatory law, uh, labor union practices. Some state constitutions mandated the segregation of public schools, public places, public transportation, segregation of restrooms, restaurants, drinking fountains uh, for whites and blacks. Now, for many, this sounds like ancient history. How many of you remember this? All right. The U.S. military was segregated. Federal workplaces were segregated. The segregation continued on into the 60s. This is where I come into play. I remember as a kid in Charlotte, North Carolina, I remember desegregation. I didn't know from one year to the next which school I was going to go to because they kept changing it. We're going to mix up blacks and whites. I went to First Ward Elementary School, downtown Charlotte, fifth to sixth grade. I remember fights in our hallways in junior high between blacks and whites. I mean, I have these, I have these indelibly etched images in my mind. I remember playing basketball. This is where a lot of us came to know our brothers through sports and such. But uh, I remember playing basketball, coming back. No, I was waiting on my mom after a basketball game at junior high, Randolph Junior High. I was outside the gym. Mom's coming to pick me up after a game. And we played Harding, uh, which was another school in our area, but they were uh, mostly black. We were mixed. They are mostly black school. They had left. The team had left in the, in the, in the team bus. 
And I was there. Not many people were there waiting outside. The bus came back. And as they came back, I heard, I heard screaming, crying, people coming out of the bus. And the bus had been rocked. Bricks, rocks thrown through the windows of the bus as they were leaving the, the, the neighborhood, the area where the, where the school was. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And then I can, you can imagine, then I was scared. I was like, uh-oh, I'm just a little white dude here. You know, don't come after me. I didn't do this, you know. I was scared. I was like, Mom, come pick me up. But they came out because they'd been, people, uh, even, I mean, cheerleaders had been cut, hit. Players had been hurt. I still remember. Some of you remember these days. Now, praise God, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. It was Ralph Ellison in 1952. He wrote the book Invisible Man. It's the story of a black man rendered invisible because of the color of his skin. See, segregation was not so much, uh, you know, whites hating black people. There was some of that going on. But it was more, and you know, it's true. We like to be with our people, right? It's not just a white issue. This is a white, black, Hispanic, Asian. We, we like to be with people who are like us. And we've got to break through that. The gospel draws us to, to break through that. Segregation, though, was more about, it's not that we hate them, let's just don't see them. So we become invisible to one another. I could go on, but I want to give you time to talk together about what you've heard. Empathy is the pathway to peace. And so we've said it. If one suffers, we all suffer. If one member is honored, we all are honored. I want you to hear the words of Dr. King from his letter from a Birmingham jail. This is a, one passage out of his letter that has meant so much to me. He, he calls out pastors like myself uh, who were more concerned about what he called false peace. He wrote this, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've, all, I've almost reached a regrettable conclusion. Imagine this, after all of his, all that he's been through, he's finding himself in jail now. His house has been, his house has been bombed with his wife and his, his baby daughter, first daughter, in the house. And then he finds himself in prison. He says, I, I've about reached this regret, regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white counselors, a white citizens counselor, that's a, really a white supremacist group, or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. So, man, if we're going to do justice, it means that we're going to, we're going to feel, we're going to understand. So around our tables, I want us to, I want us to talk. Uh, listen to this. I want you to hear this. Jesus was not controversial because of exclusivity, but because of his radical inclusivity. And it threatened those who were in the exclusive power. This is a good word for the church. Most of our energy around exclusivity is about protecting power and identity more than loving the outsider. And so what I want you to do around your table, take just a brief moment. If you don't know everyone around the table, if you're with the same group from last week, you can press on. If there's anybody new, introduce yourself real quick. But I want somebody... To, to take the lead, to keep us on task in these questions. We're going to go to about 825. And so jump in on the questions and just start talking about what you've heard and what you've learned. All right, jump in. And I'll bring us back together in just a little bit. I'm sorry to stop. I'm sorry to end the conversation. But we wanted to get you back to, to family and kids and whomever else you got to be with today, friends. So uh, let me have your attention. And then we're going to wrap up our time. Wow. I trust that you heard some great things at your table. This is, these are challenging, difficult conversations, but I've already heard from, from others that, man, we're taking it to another level this week. And I'm so grateful. Uh, you know, when we ask the question, what can, what can we do specifically? And, and it's seeking understanding. It's what we're doing, you know, for us to understand 
Um, it's to teach our kids. Uh, it's, to, it's to pass on to the next generation. What we came to at my table really is what we just kept describing as discipleship. For a man to come alongside another man, whether he's white or black or otherwise, and teach and guide. We're going to talk about some very practical steps next week as we hear from Pastor Carter talking about what, what, what is it. You know, as he and I have talked, I realize as a white man, when I think about what can a white man do to help with this, this situation and the issues that we face, I don't know. He knows, right? That's where we step into this space with humility saying, I, I don't have the answers, but I think you can teach me. And so next week we're going to be taught and it's going to be a great, great time. I was reminded, uh, some of you know that I have a daughter getting married next weekend. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. But uh, I had a friend of mine tell me not long ago, here's the test. You want to know if you're a racist? Tell me who your daughter can't marry. So with that, um, with that, here's what I want to do. Uh, and, he's, and he's a white brother, but you know, that's the way it played out. But um, we're going to bring these guys up here. They're going to make a couple of announcements and then I'm going to close us in prayer or at your tables. We're going to pray and let you go. But before you go, uh, we're, I'm going to challenge you again. Uh, we want to take pictures. We want to get the word out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, wherever else. Uh, and it's hashtag one Dallas is what we're looking at. But we'll, we'll announce that as we go. We're going to wrap it up. You guys. Dude, awesome. Awesome. All right, we got a few announcements. Uh, you're going to tell us first uh, what's something that's happened at Concord and actually inviting our guys to be part of it. Go for it, Homer. Uh, first of all, before my group that I sat with today, before y'all leave, I had a lot of wisdom in my group, and I want to make sure I get a picture with the guys um, because I know a lot of times from my neighborhood, the old white man is not who they would envision somebody who looks as young as I do. I'm actually older than what I look. But they wouldn't envision those two being able to sit and have a dialogue and discussion. So all that wisdom I got to sit with today, I want to make sure I'm able to put that out on social media and do some positive with those pictures. So you're um, saying there's some old white men in this room? There's some wisdom. Oh, there's some wisdom. That's okay. I'm just, just checking. Just, okay. There's also some young remember, white guys remember, here. Remember, I, I celebrated a right, birthday. Okay. I'm not getting older. I'm just getting wiser. Y'all got it? There you go. I don't know how old I am. I'm just wiser. So, uh, but we do have an event coming up on November the 12th, I believe. Eric, it's the Veterans uh, Day Banquet. Eric, uh, where are you at, Eric? Are you in here? Wait, just stand yeah. up and wait. Oh, there he is. Is, it was, I saw him somewhere. Anyway, November 12th, it's Veterans Day dinner. Is that what it is? We need about 10, I believe, volunteers. First of all, wave your hands if you're a veteran. Okay, thank, so you, nice thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I chickened out, okay? At the time I was in high school, I was about to start the process to apply to the Air Force Academy, and I saw the time commitment that it would take, because I wanted to fly airplanes, if y'all don't know, the commitment. 12 years, I believe it was at the time, a combination of active reserve. And I had an uncle who was in the Army, and I had seen him go from Panama to Iraq to places I still don't know, back to Iraq. And I was like, man, to be a pilot, I know how that life is going to look. You're going to be all around the world, no life in America. And so I didn't commit, but I applaud and salute all of you guys who did, sir. Yes, right. yes. yes. As they say, there's a lot of things happening in this world, and at the end of the day, a lot of people will not come and mess with the United States because of you all. So That's right. I thank you yep. for taking the time out of your life hey, and, to make and, sure that we're free and safe. Amen. Amen. And Park City's guys, just I want you all to know Concord has invited us to come. If you are a veteran at Park City's or if you know a veteran at Park City's, you all have been invited to join Concord and the veterans there on the 12th. Uh, is, is that okay that I say yes, that? Yes, yes. yes that, that's that, what he was going to make sure that, oh, the, that you yes. all know. Come eat, fellowship, uh, and have a good time. So.
like I said, Derek is a part of the veterans ministry, and Eric, I saw him stand up. Stand up on the table, Eric. You know you're short. Yeah. <laughs> he's a Navy guy. <laughs> but he's over there. Yeah, you. <laughs> All right. Uh, awesome. Anything else? You good? All right, four quick things I need a guys in here to know. Uh, Park City's guys, number one. Everybody say one. One, we golf. A lot of guys have been talking about getting together for golf, establishing friendships that way. Damon Barry, there's his email address. If you want to golf, guys, Park Cities, and Concord guys, we'd love to put you together on a golf outing email, D.A. Barry. Uh, not yet. Haven't set a date yet. We're just going to figure out who would like to do that. Bus to Concord, which is next week. Some of us at Park Cities, that may be the older guys in the room, cannot get down there driving. Uh, and if you're a younger guy and want to save gas money like me, uh, email SF Home. That's myself. If you want to take a bus to Concord, we'll be leaving from here next week at 6.30 so we can be down there at 7. We will leave at 6.30, not 6.45 waiting for somebody. So we'll leave at 6.30. Email me if you want to be on that bus. Thursday study, Dan Young. If you'd like to be part of Bible study here, Thursday mo morning, Concord guys are also always invited to that. Email Dan Young right there, DJ Young. And then Go Training. Our men's ministry in the church is built around reproducing discipleship groups. If you'd like to be in one of those, get trained to make disciples, you can email SF Home. That's number four. Good? Good. All right. Jeffrey Warren, close us. Hey, um, we'll wrap it up. Uh, listen to this, Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man. Everybody say one new man. One new man. One new man in place of the two. So making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Amen, amen and amen. Okay, let's do this. Let's all stand together. I want to encourage you, uh, reach out to another brother. You don't have to wait on a program. You know, the gospel travels at the speed of relationships. You don't have to wait on a golf outing. You don't have to wait on a Bible study. Connect with men. Grab hold of a hand next to you. And I'm going to pray over us, and then I want you to take pictures with your group before you head out. So great to have you guys here. Thank you, Concord men. We love you. We love you. We thank you for being here today. We're going to join you next week. We can't wait. So let's pray together. Lord, we stand before you, our holy God. We stand humbly before you. Because apart from the blood of Christ, we would be separated from you. We would still be searching. We'd be purposeless. We'd be hellbound apart from you sending your son to die on the cross for us. We'd still be divided. We wouldn't have love in our hearts. We would have no ability towards humility or empathy or any idea or desire to seek understanding. But because you've rescued us from our sin, because you have come into our hearts, we are new men. And we want to be a part of this ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for you. And as we go forth into this week, into this day, we're going to look for opportunities to bridge the gap. We're not going to wait for another event, another Bible study. We're going to be active. Lord, we, we, we know that as you've transformed our hearts, we cannot but care about this issue and every issue that breaks and divides and keeps people down and brings about injustice in our world. We want to walk humbly. We want to love mercy. And we want to do justice as men this week. Use every man. Bless each family represented here. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. and amen. All right, way to go, men. All right, get those pictures, put them out there. <laughs>